Today is April 24th, 2017. My name is Rebecca Ostis, and I am in the Chicago McCormick Place Convention Center during the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. Today, I have the pleasure and honor of interviewing Dr. John Headley White for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Headley White has been an APS member since 1969 and has been affiliated with Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard since 1961. Dr. Headley White's research has focused on the solubility and physiology of oxygen uptake, which led to a clinical focus on respiratory pathophysiology and its mitigation. John, welcome to the Living History Project, and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed for the series. If you are ready, I would like to ask you a few questions about your career. Good morning. Good morning. John, you were born in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England. Can you tell us about your family upbringing and how you became interested in science? Yes, being born in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, I'm a Geordie. And we don't like the Scots, and we don't like <laughs> the English, and we try to keep them apart. Uh, but uh, Townside is still a very tribal area. Uh, the first thing that I remember vividly in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne was that my nurse took me and my baby sister out to one of the parks. And Newcastle has some lovely parks. And the air raid alarms go off, which was the start of World War II, September the 3rd, 1939. And then the next thing that happened was that I went down with my father and mother and sister uh, to the uh, Cotswolds, where my father was about to embark to, for France with the British Expeditionary Force. And uh, it was bitterly cold. And he left uh, at the end of 39 and went up to the Belgian border. The Germans uh, uh, came through Belgium, and my father, who was commanding officer of one of the British uh, casualty clearing stations, retreated and then was uh, the senior surgeon, but not the commanding officer, of the 8th General Hospital in Rennes. Uh, in the doorway to Brittany. After France capitulated and my father had been operating for about uh, 72 hours continuously on uh, British and French casualties, uh, they decided, he and uh, his senior non-commissioned officer, uh, decided that they were going to go to Spain with the wounded. So they went round Rennes collecting petrol, sometimes at gunpoint, sometimes with money, and they set off for uh, Spain. And they had commandeered some trucks, as well as their ambulances, and they came into uh, San Nazaire, uh, which is about 75 miles on the way to Spain, and the Germans, despite the uh, June 22nd, uh, 1940 armistice, were still bombing. And uh, my uh, father had a radiographer who had been a ship's pilot. And he said, why didn't they capture one of the uh, ships that was in a dry dock? Well, well actually, it was, they'd flooded the dry dock. Mm -hmm. And the uh, guy who, who was the senior person in the lock gates refused to uh, uh, com comply, saying that France had capitulated. So, uh, he was shot. And they brought the uh, Glen Affric, which was an old British uh, uh, tramp steamer, out of San Jose Harbor under bombardment. And they passed the Cunard liner, the Lancastria, who uh, got sunk by German bombers as they passed. And the oil spread over the uh, San Jose Harbor and the Germans bombed it within centuries, so they took on a lot of burnt people to, uh, uh, and at about five knots. Uh, they arrived uh, in uh, uh, July in 
Plymouth. They had come so slowly that they evaded uh, British uh, radar. And there uh, in Plymouth was Winston Churchill, who was now prime minister. And he gave my father uh, an immediate award, or rather on behalf of, of King George VI. He gave my father an immediate award of the Distinguished Service Order. And uh, we'd been told that uh, uh, my father was uh, missing, presumed uh, dead. And uh, he wasn't allowed to contact my mother, and thus myself, because they wanted secrecy of the sinking of the Lancastria and all the burnt people. So my father had to uh, arrange for the transport of the wounded from the, the burnt people from the Lancastria to the burn centers that the British had already still, uh, set up. And uh, that's described in a paper that I have coming out next month in the Ulster Medical Journal. And as a result of that, my father was made commanding officer of the 31st uh, British General Hospital in Northern Ireland, in Belfast. And that was a uh, collection of all the young, leading British academic uh, physicians, surgeons, and ophthalmologists many of whom had been American trained at the Mass General or at uh, uh, Rockefeller or Stanford and so on and so forth. And they kept, um, kept appearing before Pearl Harbor, although this country was still neutral. And uh, they uh, uh, said what they wanted for when they came into the war. Uh, I got to know quite a few Americans as a small boy that were uh, piloting uh, Lendley's Catalinas and flying fortresses and so on. And uh, one of them told me that he found the Bismarck. And I didn't really believe that an American could have found the Bismarck <laughs> when, when no one else could. So uh, uh, when the uh, more Americans came just after Pearl Harbor. One of their jobs was to make certain that I could read scientific English. Yeah. So uh, Ted Badger, who was a Harvard professor and head of medicine for the uh, Harvard Fifth General Hospital, which was going to merge with my father, uh, was given the uh, job together with a uh, British ophthalmologist who eventually became Sir Benjamin Rycroft and, uh, to teach me to read on a 1912 Gray's Anatomy. Oh. So I got to know all about the human body as I uh, uh, raised and uh, the Northern Irish uh, Belfast education was pretty Calvinistic. Uh, they didn't approve of course of me being taught on, on a uh, Gray's Anatomy. But uh, after uh, the uh, time with the Americans, the, there was a big epidemic of jaundice uh, in the uh, uh, American troops and in the British troops in Northern Ireland. So they amalgamated the Harvard Hospital with the uh, one from Columbia, New York, and with my father as commanding officer. And, uh, then uh, the American, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt arrived to inspect. And uh, I was introduced to her and I remember that uh, I wanted to know where her husband was, but I was told <laughs> to shut up on that. <laughs> so, and uh, then um, my father was moved back to uh, uh, England to liaise with the Harvard surgery professors uh, for the planning of uh, the North African landings and then of the D-Day landings. And he was made uh, uh, consulting surgeon for Northern Command in Britain. And uh, we had Americans uh, professors in our house all the time. 
and uh, they decided that uh, I should go to the Dragon School at Oxford, which was a boarding school for boys and girls. Very, very uh, academic. Most of the kids were, uh, uh, had, their parents were uh, professors at, at Oxford. And uh, there I, uh, they uh, interviewed, they took on a competitive exam, one in 10, and I was told I wasn't smart enough. So my father called up the professor of uh, surgery at Oxford, who was the leading neurosurgeon for the Allies, and he had three uh, children at the Dragon School, so he told the headmaster to take me. And uh, the Dragon School uh, was very competitive academically. You were asked at a moment's notice to get up and talk for 10 minutes on something mm -hmm. that the headmaster or the master wanted you to talk, and you had to keep the other students from barracking, and you had to know something about the background of what you were talking. And um, it, it, it was, and still is, the most academic institution that I've been connected with. And from there, uh, I took a scholarship to Harrow, which was the exact opposite of the Dragon School. My, I had two chief, uh, or three chief achievements at Harrow. I had to teach a class on waiting at table, oh. and I had two kings in my class, the king of, uh, of Iraq and the king of uh, Jordan. Uh, and uh, I played rugby for, uh, for Harrow, and there was an American on the far wing, so we were equivalent to wide receivers, and he would do lateral passes. Now, you can't pass forward in rugby, you have to pass uh, back, slightly back. But of course, in a British gale, it's pretty difficult to take these very long lateral passes. <laughs> and when I dropped, I got booed and oh. so on and so forth. <sighs> and from there, um, I decided that I wanted to go to Clare College, Cambridge. Why Clare? Well, uh, two things. It's very beautiful. It's next to King's. It uh, was founded in 1372, I think. And uh, I failed the entrance exam, uh, I think, six times. Oh. And th so uh, I said to my father, would uh, he double any scholarship I got? to go to Cambridge. He said, yes, you're not, you know, you're not getting in. You won't get a scholarship. But I got a football scholarship. Ah. And uh, so, uh, but still, Claire didn't want to take me. So I said that to the headmaster of Harrow that I want to call up uh, uh, Sir Lionel Whitby because he was head of blood banking for the Allies. And he was master of Downing now that the war had ended. And his uh, uh, executive officer uh, was his wife, who uh, was uh, a colonel in her own right. And uh, she answered the phone, luckily, when I called, and she said, oh, well, hardly come to tea. Uh, so I told the headmaster that uh, I was going to tea, and he said, good, good, talk your way into Cambridge, you see. So we, I got on well with the Whitbys, who I had met and who were friends of Cairns and knew all my father's friends and all the rest of it. And uh, Downing wanted to improve the rugby team as well. <laughs> uh, so they accepted me, but I sort of doubled down, if you like. I said I wanted to go to Clare. So uh, Sir Lionel Whitby went to the phone in the sitting room, and I couldn't quite hear what he was saying. I didn't know who he was talking to. But he came away from the phone saying, uh, John, you'll get in to Clare. So three days later, Sir Henry Thurkle, who was a one-man admissions committee to Clare, uh, said to my father that because of the extraordinary circumstances, he would accept me. What I didn't realize was that Sir Lionel Whitby was the reigning vice chancellor, and therefore he was Sir Henry Thurkle's boss. So I went up to read Natural Science Tripos, and at that time, unless you got uh, first or second class honors in Natural Science Tripos, 
uh, you didn't go to your clinical work, which was generally at a London teaching hospital, but could be at Oxford or Cambridge, uh, the teaching hospitals there. And uh, in the first year, I played quite a bit of rugger, and I found the exams very difficult. But there was a three-hour, uh, three-hour oh, biochemistry practical, and by luck would have it, there were about 160 of us taking the exam. Uh, by luck would have it, the person next to me didn't show up for the exam, so I got asked whether I could have two sets of, of uh, retorts and buns and burners and everything. And the invigilators sort of said, yes, I suppose, if, you know, no one's ever not turned up before. But the statutory seven minutes was over. So we had to analyze and comment on a white powder. They wanted to know what the Michaelis constant was and what was wrong, what, what uh, anything else we wished to note about the white powder. So I did that and recognized it as a lemonade powder. And luckily, in my seven attempts to get into Cambridge, I had analyzed a similar lemonade powder. So I knew the Michaelis constant because I'd done it before. And I started looking for arsenic and uh, antimony and baking powder and all the stuff that you might load into cheap uh, uh, lemonade powder. And about three days later, the chairman of biochemistry at uh, uh, Cambridge said, did I want a career in academic uh, biochemistry? So I said, no, I was going to go to St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And then after that, uh, I intended to go to the United States to Harvard. Oh, he said, you seem to have your career well planned out. Well, then Sir Henry Thurkill said I had been within three marks of 300 uh, of being thrown out. But I said, well, Sir Henry, I've just been offered a career in academic biochemistry. He thought I was a Baron Munchausen. And he did uh, telephone 10 days later to me to say he'd been wrong, to, that I had indeed been 27% ahead of everybody, and that was what allowed me to go on. Then I lost an eye playing cricket. Uh, I didn't spot a Chinaman. Now, some of you may not know what a Chinaman is at cricket, but it's a, an, a fake knuckleballer bringing it, instead of doing that, he brings it out of the back of his hand. And I was keeping wicket, and I didn't spot it, and, and the ball got hooked into my right uh, retina and hmm. destroyed my right retina. So my mother had to read all the uh, great big fat physiology and biochemistry text. And the Claire put me next, gave me uh, rooms next to the Cambridge Library, which had a very good cafeteria. And of course, uh, has by right, a, uh, the right of having every book published in, at that time, the British Commonwealth. I think now it's in Britain. So I started reading uh, when my eye was uh, basically blind, and my mother went back to Newcastle uh, to uh, uh, continue the, uh, by now it was post-World War. And uh, then uh, when I went up to Bart's for an interview, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which is just coming up to its 900th anniversary, and we've been figuring out whether we treated anyone from the Battle of Hastings, mm. We didn't treat any Normans, we do know that, but there was a little bit of, no, not a little bit, there was a Holocaust after Hastings and the Anglo-Saxons didn't appear in any records after that. So it, we presumably just treated uh, uh, the invading people. The, uh, it was a teenage battle, Hastings, and uh, the, they would, uh, the survivors that would be patients at Bart's were in middle age and had had fractures and so on and so forth. So uh, I was asked at Bart's whether I had a morning 
did I own morning clothes so that when on Founders Day all the house officers had to uh, appear in morning clothes. But I found the uh, clinical side of medicine at Bart uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, Bart doesn't charge patients. Uh, in the, what, 1130 statute or whatever it was, 1120 uh, something or other, uh, it said that it should be for the patients who had served the realm. And it, the founder was the king's court jester. And everybody at Bart's who was on the house staff, and there were five uh, senior house physicians and five junior house physicians, five senior house physicians, five junior house physicians, Everybody was advisory to those uh, people who just graduated, generally from Oxford or Cambridge, but also from London University. And if somebody, if some world famous surgeon or physician didn't come, when you as a house officer or a house surgeon summoned them to Bart's uh, in the middle of the night, their only valid excuse for not losing their uh, Bart's appointment at that time was that they were dealing with the royal family. Interesting. Uh, so you learnt a lot of tact, mm. uh, and uh, I got to relative prominence at Bart's because I became chair of the uh, Abenethan Society, which was founded in 1752, I think. And you could summon to give an Abenethan lecture once a month, anyone in the world. Oh. So. Uh, uh, my most famous pick was uh, uh, McFarlane Burnett, who had dinner with the committee afterwards. And he produced, he was an Australian, he said, ow, oh, I've got something sticking in my backside. So he opened his uh, wallet pocket and produced the Order of Merit, which he oh. collected that day. And uh, it was a wonderful position because uh, uh, I got the uh, chairman of surgery at uh, the Mass General to come, I got the chairman of anesthesia to come, and uh, the result was that when I applied for a job at the Mass General, uh, I knew them from World War II and I knew them from the Escalapian Society and their con mm -hmm. connections with, with Bart's. The highest honor Bart's can give is to make you a perpetual student. And you're limited to three, I think, a year or so. But, but that's for the people who've really made international reputations. And uh, so uh, the night before uh, we emigrated, and by this time I had uh, uh, got married, just got married, to a medical student. Uh, the Sir James Patterson Ross, who was the professor of surgery at Bart's, uh, called me to his offices at 10.30 at night. And there was a tradition, at, there is a tradition at Bart's that if you're getting fired, it has to be done by the head of medicine oh. or the head of surgery. So I thought I was being uh, fired. So Sir James looked up at me, writing at his desk in the evening. And he said, Headley, you're off to the Mass General tomorrow. He said, the, having the 150th anniversary. And he said, Headley, keep your goddamn mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and the butler who'd come in to show me and tap me on the shoulder. And he said, I think uh, you say goodbye. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we arrived a bit late at the Mass General because of fog in the milestone. And we'd come over steerage. And uh, the first patient I had at the Mass General bit me. He was a 17-year-old, and so I was out of action for a little while because I'd had my right hand bitten by oh my goodness. patient. So I stayed at the Mass General in Churchill's Department of Surgery. Churchill was a pretty good physiologist. He'd, he'd written some papers in 1927, and he'd been head of surgery for the Allies in the Mediterranean so that he knew all the leading British and American surgeons. And... Uh, 
he suggested the first paper, which has been revisited in what I gave you. And uh, that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we used uh, Routon from Cambridge, who was professor of colloid science. Uh, the, Lord Adrian didn't really like Routon very much. They were both Trinity men. And Lord Adrian basically said who was appointed in physiology. Uh, Barcroft had by that time retired, but Adrian was a de facto head of uh, uh, physiology and also master of Trinity. And uh, Adrian uh, was succeeded by, by Trevelyan who, as master of Trinity. And I decided that my uh, supervision at Clare in uh, uh, biochemistry didn't uh, come up to what by now was a considerable interest. So uh, I went to Sir Henry Thurkill and said, could I change biochemistry supervisor? He said, well, I thought you were top and practical. I said, no, I want a person who's really publishing. And although this is a wide uh, statement, and, and I don't think I've really learned anything from somebody who was not currently publishing first-class work uh, in leading refereed uh, journals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went over to Trinity and uh, I met in the great court at Trinity, by chance, uh, uh, the uh, Trevelyan, who was the master. And he said, you know, he, he knew me from Northumberland where I had uh, ridden one of my grandfather's horses over one of his herbaceous borders. <laughs> and he'd said, uh, well, at least it was, you chose uh, chrysanthemums and <laughs> not anything more valuable. <laughs> so, so he said, well, what are you doing here, Head Lizzie? I said, well, I've come for a supervision in biochemistry. And he said, yes, yes, I heard about that. Can I come with you? Well, Trinity have a tradition that the only person who can fire you as a fellow is the master. So we'd go up to this place in Neville's Court, up the stairs, and when the uh, young Don opens the, the door and he sees the master there, he thinks he's being fired, you see. So Trevelyan said, no, he said, you, you're, you're becoming famous. That's why they're even coming from a hundred yards uh, <laughs> up the cam to see you. So I was uh, given the job uh, and I Trillard suggested it, it actually that I read the proofs, the scientific proofs of the manuscripts that uh, at that time Adrian was demanding that he read everything that was submitted from Trinity Cambridge. So that was a wonderful education. Because it's, if you didn't understand it, uh, you would sort of write as an undergraduate over it. And uh, I got a sort of reputation for reading proofs. Uh, and I got to read standard textbooks of, of surgery and anesthesia. Uh, wonderful training. Uh, when I arrived at the Mass General, uh, we'd had trouble with the visas. Uh, we went to the Grosvenor, the M American Embassy in Grosvenor Square, mm -hmm. and I was due to get $900 for a full year of surgery at the Mass General. And my wife, who was going to be Sydney Farber's intern, mm -hmm. uh, uh, she was getting nothing for the honor of being Sydney Farber's intern. And uh, we were told that we would starve. You couldn't live, two of you, on $900 for the year. And you couldn't take money out of England because England was uh, still in parlous academic uh, uh, straits. So uh, he said, no, this young man said, no, we couldn't have a visa. So I said, well, get your boss and get your boss to come in. Well, as luck would have it, the boss had two kids who were uh, medical students. And we got acceptance letters, of course, from uh, Children's Hospital for Faber and from uh, 
the chief of surgery for the Mass General, and he looked at this young man. <laughs> he said, my kids would give 100,000 to have these letters. Yeah. So we got a visa. Oh. And uh, thereafter, I think, all I've had to do is, is be polite. Oh. Uh, you go up the Harvard ranks by other research universities offering you positions. And uh, Harvard had a sort of briefing system when they knew that you were going to Duke or Stanford or uh, UCSF or uh, Yale. Uh, they gave you a list of questions to ask about the weaknesses of the other medical schools. And uh, okay. that, of course, ensured that you didn't get the job mm. even if you wanted yeah. it. But it was also proof to the powers that be at Tarvard that uh, you deserve tenure or you deserve a promotion and so on and so forth. And then I was made secretary, secretary of the Faculty of Medicine with the dean being Ebert. So Ebert had been a DPhil student as, uh, before he became uh, head of medicine at the Mass General and then uh, dean of Harvard Medical School. He'd been a DPhil student with Lord Flory. And Flory's kids were at the Dragon School. And uh, we used to play tennis together. Uh, Lord Flory and his uh, kids and uh, the D. Phil student. So uh, that was a fascinating job. And uh, I continued as uh, uh, head of anesthesia and intensive care at the Beth Israel on the Harvard Medical School campus. And uh, I could do both uh, jobs with superb secretarial and administrative help. And uh, there we are. How did your research area of expertise develop, and who were the people who influenced your career? Well, my father asked me once why all the people who'd mentored me got knighted or ennobled after they'd finished teaching me. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I said earlier rather brashly that I hadn't learned from people who weren't doing research. Well, my tutor at Clare, the overall tutor, was Sir Michael Stoker. And he got knighted for being uh, an eminent virologist. And um, the person who had taught me to read in Northern Ireland, Sir Benjamin Rycroft, he got knighted for uh, uh, his services to ophthalmology and to the royal family. And Sir Clifford Norton Morgan, who I was senior house surgeon to, he got knighted uh, for his surgery in Cairo and in Africa and so on. And uh, they treated me uh, oh, basically like an uh, academic father would. They would say, you've got to read this and read that. And sometimes I would be told to read 100 pages before we started operating in the morning and so on, which meant that you learned to uh, work when you were very tired. And to some extent, that continued at the, uh, at the Mass Journal. And then Harvard moved me over to uh, become head of anesthesia and intensive care at the Beth Israel. How did I recruit? We t I took over a department of about three faculty and ended with a faculty of 100. And I had to fly around the world to recruit that was made easier, much easier, by uh, Kennedy being the uh, senior senator from Massachusetts. And the Harvard uh, immigration office would write a letter on Harvard stationery, countersigned by me and somebody high up at Harvard to Kennedy. And if uh, we wanted someone in three weeks, uh, the, we would get a Senate approval. And uh, Kennedy's staff were absolutely superb. Uh, they would arrange everything, and the guy would appear, uh, uh, having uh, had a meal, generally, with the Kennedy staff. 
in the peer of the work. Uh, and uh, I was most impressed by that set up. Interesting. So. If you were to give it some thought, what would you consider to be your most significant contribution to physiology? Trying to teach clinicians physiology. Mm. The, the, the problem then and now is that sick patients generally die from something that the specialists looking after them don't know about. Uh, we did a survey of why people died after abdominal surgery, some of which is referred to in what I just handed you. And uh, the chief cause is mesenteric infarction. All right, so you have to know everything about keeping the blood supply to the gut going while abdominal surgery or chest surgery or heart surgery is going. And if you are a really good surgical team and the mesenteric artery or the other arteries start not to look right, uh, you have to tell the surgeon that, that something's got to be done to the arteries. And they can either be grafted or, uh, or a, a pedicle flap can be run up or there can be an endarterectomy. Now the average surgeon doesn't know how to do these additional uh, things. And I've tried to get the more physiology into the teaching, but it hasn't been easy because uh, uh, Tosterson, who I think was a president of this uh, society, uh, abolished physiology as a department. And I think, uh, I think that's a pity. Now, there's no doubt at all that World War I and World War II uh, settled, divided the surgeons. The wartime surgeons could tie knots like that, that in the bottom of the pelvis and uh, uh, things didn't bleed and so on and so forth. Whereas the surgeons who didn't have the advantage of uh, a major war um, were not as adept. And of course, uh, I learnt a lot of sort of war type surgery uh, uh, about being a casualty uh, hospital for London. And uh, yes, I, I, I mean, war is an awful thing, but it does advance uh, yeah. medicine and surgery. As a long-standing member of APS, I'm sure you probably attended APS meetings early in your career. So can you tell us about your first APS meeting? Well, they said I hadn't published enough, and what I'd published was in, the, was in the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet and so on. And that got Ted Radford and uh, I think Tosterson, who was a Duke at the time, they said this was ridiculous. And I got in the next, uh, next time. Uh, I chaired a section on lung uh, pathophysiology that was held in the autumn uh, at uh, Albany, New York. I found that fascinating because it was a little bit like the Abnethan Society. You could summon people right. to come and talk on this. Uh, uh, so yes, I learned more from the uh, summer autumn meetings, I think, than which had a focus uh, than I did from the big face of meeting. But I joined um, uh, pharmacology uh, and my wife is a member of uh, the uh, investigation of pathology and she's actually going to the uh, award of the gold-headed cane this afternoon yeah. and she's here with me. Um, yes, I, I, and the other thing, of course, is that you can call up the uh, physiology offices and get telephone numbers that may not be, if you want to talk to a physiologist in Sweden or mm -hmm. Copenhagen or somewhere, uh, yes, uh, I'm all for it. Wonderful. 
Your narrative also indicated that lessons for the future can emerge from the study of medical history. Can you expand on this idea and provide some examples? Well, I've been writing about what I told you about. <laughs> and uh, the president of Harvard is a, uh, a distinguished medical historian. Harvard uh, is trying to catch up with uh, Hopkins and Ann Arbor and Caltech in uh, its history uh, of science and medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are wonderful, absolutely wonderful archival resources at Harvard. And you go into them four and five floors under the Lamont Library or the Widener Library and so on and so forth. Nobody's been there for, for a long time. So there, there's a future there. Yeah. But um, the thing that I think American medicine, or possibly world medicine, has to worry about is that some of these seminal papers on immunotherapy by uh, uh, the group at Mary's and, and Almoth Wright, um, there's only one copy extant. They haven't been digitized. The University of Michigan is extremely good at getting for you stuff. Harvard was stopped in its digitization efforts by um, copyright uh, uh, problems. If I were president of the United States, that's one of the things that I would say, that if something is of value to the United States, uh, copyright doesn't, shouldn't apply anymore. But Europe in particular, I think, has tightened copyright and they've tightened the permissions you acquire for uh, fine art, reproduction, and so on. Well, that, that, that's wrong. But, uh, uh, the, you can't, I've just been told by Q, the British uh, archives at Q, that you can't have access to a patient record for a World War II patient under 75 years from the death of wow. the patient. Hmm. 75 years. Well, it means that you can actually, according to the regulations, go to the Lord Chancellor's office, but the, I think the Lord Chancellor's uh, office has been abolished. Well, thank you for participating in the Society's Living History Program. I truly enjoyed the opportunity to learn more about your career. My pleasure. Thank you.